last talk of uh, today and of uh, this session, and the talk will be given by Jamin Hewland, who is uh, working with uh, Aruba. Uh, it happens to be a company, an enterprise of uh, a Hewlett Packard enterprise company. <laughs> Please, let's listen to him. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk, uh, Production Ready Flask and Django's, Django Apps on Kubernetes. So, uh, I'm Jamie. Um, I spent the past three or four years of my career working as a site reliability engineer, which is a sort of DevOps role, and I worked on a lot of container things. And now I'm a back-end engineer at Aruba, um, and I work on Python services, primarily Django and Flask applications. Uh, I have done a talk before at PyCon uh, back at in 2017 about containerizing Django web apps, um, and this talk is kind of like a continuation of that, but with more stuff particular to Kubernetes, and we're not really going to talk about Docker too much. Um, if you want to reach me, there's some of my details. Um, yeah, so kind of like fair warning for this talk. Uh, it's not an intro to Kubernetes. I'm not going to explain how that works uh, or an intro to Python web apps, but hopefully if you kind of understand one of these things, it will help you understand the other. Um, and there will be more YAML than Python, probably. I don't think there's actually any Python code. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then a note, most of the text is in Arial, but when I'm talking about a Kubernetes resource, like a top level thing, I've tried to always do that in like a monospace, bold title case thing, so you know that's a Kubernetes thing. Um, right, so the agenda, uh, basically I'm going to introduce why you might want to use Kubernetes, uh, then I'm going to talk about what I call the WSGI stack, um, then the kind of the main part of the talk is how you get this thing to run well on Kubernetes, so I'm going to run through those things, um, and then just at the very end I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see as the sort of future in this space. Um, right, so why Kubernetes? Big topic, um, but these are kind of the three main reasons I see you might want to be using Kubernetes. So to start out, abstraction. Um, abstracting over several hosts. Uh, when you use Kubernetes, you're able to uh, reason about the compute, storage, and networking resources of multiple hosts at once. Um, it also, because it provides this kind of higher level abstractions, Developers don't have to think about kind of sysadmin tasks, like you don't really care what operating system is running on a particular host or what ver version of what package you have there. Um, a lot of that is just abstracted away. Um, there's also multi-cloud support. So all three of the big cloud vendors have a kind of managed Kubernetes service you can use. So if you make your app work on Kubernetes, it's easier to kind of port it between different cloud services. Um, also, because of these abstractions, you can kind of define the infrastructure requirements for your application in terms of the Kubernetes constructs. So you can say, my app needs you know, this compute networking storage. Um, also, uh, because you treat all your hosts as kind of this pool of resources, you can potentially use these resources more efficiently. Instead of kind of having a dedicated host that runs one thing, you instead let Kubernetes best run your application where it makes sense within uh, your infrastructure. Then automation, um, deployments become a lot easier with Kubernetes in some ways. Um, I'll talk about that a bit later. Also Kubernetes can do kind of failover scenarios. Um, so if a particular host goes offline, it'll move all the containers over to another one. Uh, if your app fails the health check, it'll restart it, things like that. Um, and this automation also helps uh, when you're tying new tools into the system. And then finally, kind of the biggest reason for me personally is that Kubernetes just has this huge ecosystem of other tools that can integrate with it. Um, and the Cloud Native Compute Foundation is kind of the overseer of a lot of these projects. Um, and you can go to their website and there's just like so many things you can do and use with Kubernetes. Um, and that means you can spend less time kind of building infrastructural tools and more time working on your actual application, the product that you're selling. Um, and then this is sort of like an evergreen tweet. Uh, if you can't see, there's like a single plank of wood held on this huge truck, and that's kind of like running your blog on Kubernetes. Kubernetes is not for um, just really running like one small thing. 
you can run your blog on Kubernetes for fun, maybe, but you'd probably run up a big bill. Um, yeah, so what sort of um, applications are we talking about? So this is kind of a part of the infrastructure that my team runs at Aruba. We're called the User Experience Insights Team. And basically, Aruba does lots of things, but we make one particular product, which is what we call a sensor, which we sell to people who run uh, Wi-Fi and Ethernet networks. And that uh, sensor will run various tests against their network, report back. We have kind of a whole data ingest pipeline, and um, various things are done with that data. And then it's presented on like a nice web interface. And the web interface the final result is kind of produced by many applications. So when we're running something um, on Kubernetes, we're kind of talking about you know, we're running several things, uh, also sort of microservices, services-oriented architecture, where you know, a single request actually results in lots of requests to various services. Um, right, and then sort of moving on to the Python side of things. So. When you run a Python web framework like Flask or Django, generally you use the web server gateway interface, WSGI, or sometimes pronounced Whiskey. Um, so what this basically does is you run the separate thing called a Whiskey server that translates the HTTP requests that come into your app into basically Python. So they become Python calls, and then your web framework responds, and the Whiskey server has a HTTP response. And the Whiskey standard defines those Python calls. Um, yeah, so what this often looks like uh, when you deploy it in practice, uh, some common whiskey servers, G-Unicorn, U-Whiskey or MicroWhiskey, uh, Django and Flask are common web frameworks. Then you might, if you have like a stateful application, then you'd have like an ORM uh, that connects to a database. And then generally you have this like web server in the front, which is like Nginx or Apache or something like that. This is kind of a lot of different uh, technologies, but to simplify it, we're kind of talking about this shape of application, where the Python code, our application that we're running, has a whiskey server, some kind of web framework, and an ORM, potentially. Um, in reality, there's actually like probably a bunch more stuff, depending on how complicated your application is, like a cache, maybe you have Celery running some long-running tasks, maybe Celery needs a message queue for all those tasks, but for today, I'm saying those are out of scope. I don't think running those on Kubernetes drastically changes things. Um, and in terms of the data stores like caches and message queues, I think most people are better off paying their cloud provider to run that for them as a managed service outside of Kubernetes. Um, and I'm actually going to go a step further than that and say the database as well. I'm not going to talk about running the database on Kubernetes. You can do that, and the tools to do that are probably better than they have ever been. But you should only do that if you really have a good reason to. Um, Right, so getting on to how we get this running on Kubernetes. First off, handling requests, which is pretty important. Um, so the thing about these Whiskey servers is that a lot of them have been kind of designed uh, with this stack in mind that we've spoken about, with the server in front of them, like Nginx, Apache, something like that. In fact, this is completely key, key to G-Unicorn's design. Um, G-Unicorn, the reason it has that name is it's based on a Ruby project called Unicorn. And the key insight of that uh, architecture is that what Unicorn said was, OK, we will put the server in front, Nginx, that will deal with all our slow clients and buffer requests as they come in so that we can just be a very, very simple, synchronous program that will just deal with fast requests from Nginx. And when you use Unicorn with its default settings, you should deploy it like this. Um, and kind of similarly for uh, uWhiskey, uh, they actually have a completely separate protocol, so Nginx kind of translates between H HTTP and uWhiskey. Um, a lot of the documentation for these Whiskey servers will also say something along the lines of, you should have a server to shield the Python program. What this means exactly is sometimes a little bit vague, um, but the point is a lot of these servers weren't designed to kind of deal with things like denial of service attacks. Um, and so the complication here is that with Kubernetes, we can't expect there to just be a web server. I think, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, it was very common that like you had kind of a LAMP stack where you just had Apache or Nginx on your web server, and that was what it was. But that's not really the case anymore. Um, 
So when I'm talking about the Kubernetes solutions for these, um, for each of these problems, I'm going to present three different ones, kind of the main solution, some kind of alternative, and then maybe like if you want to start trying some new things out. So first of all, a solution to this would be to use a sidecar proxy in a pod. So Kubernetes has this construct called a pod, um, which allows you to put two containers on the same host, so two or two or more containers co-located. Um, so then we can just run nginx in a container together with our Python application in another container in the same pod. And this has some advantages. We don't have to modify the app in any way if we were running like this before. We maintain this kind of pre-Kubernetes environment. Um, but you do have to run this additional container to have nginx, and you have some more Kubernetes YAML to set up nginx. Um, an alternative is you can sort of remove or reduce the need to use nginx or some kind of proxy. Um, so you can configure some of these whiskey servers to use a different kind of uh, worker class is usually what it's called. Um, so you can have something that's async and can deal better with slow clients. Uh, so in that case, you don't have to set up extra proxy. Uh, you maybe have low overhead. And this is sort of okay if you're using an ingress in Kubernetes, which may mean that you already have kind of a front-end load balancer that is buffering incoming requests. Um, but when you do switch to an async worker, often there are code changes required in your app. Um, and I would recommend kind of doing a load test if you're going to do this. Um, then finally, gold star, if you're running like a service mesh on Kubernetes, which is more advanced stuff, then you already have kind of a proxy server running in every pod anyway. You can switch on the buffering and perform a lot of the same tasks. But running a service mesh can be quite a lot of work. Um, so kind of the recommended solution, I'm just going to show you how to do the sidecar proxy. Um, right, so on the left, we have the containers as kind of part of some YAML for Kubernetes. Uh, so we define the containers. We have two containers in our pod, like I said. So there's a Django app in this case, and then Nginx. Um, so in this case, we have GUnicorn as our whiskey server, and we're listening on localhost. And this means your Django application is not um, immediately exposed to anything else in the network. And because containers in a pod share a network namespace, um, Nginx is, is still able to connect to your Django application. And then on the right, we have a config map, which we're going to talk about a bit more, but that's a Kubernetes construct just to uh, configure things. So you can set up a config file, and you can see at the bottom, we have a volume that puts this config file in a volume used by the Nginx container. Cool. Next problem, serving static files. So this is not problem for every application, you might not need to serve static files. Static files are normally like the CSS, JavaScript files, etc. So the way it's normally done with something like Nginx is you route all the requests to like slash static, and those are handled by Nginx, and Nginx will just serve files from a certain directory. Uh, and in this way, it completely bypasses any of your Python code. Um, and the uWSGI documentation says, you know, it's inefficient to serve files, static files using uWSGI. So that's kind of the recommended system. Um, but yeah, obviously we need an Nginx to do that. So the first solution is we use that same sidecar proxy, um, and then we can set up a volume that will contain the static files, and this will be shared between the two pods. Um, Similar advantages to the last problem solution I talked about, so you don't have to modify the app. You might be running just like you were before, um, but maybe you need to run this additional container. Also, the volume can be a little bit complicated because the way it works is you set up an empty volume, and then at startup, you copy the static files from your Django container into the volume, and then they can be served by the Nginx container. So additional startup time. Then an alternative, which a lot of people do, is use something like Django Storages, which will basically upload your static files to S3 or something similar, and then your, ser your files are just served from there. Um, this is like super simple and easy, but it does add this kind of additional step to your CI system, so you're going to have to upload those files. Um, also, there are certain kind of optimizations in terms of compressing the static files and setting the right headers. Uh, that it's not really possible with S3. And then kind of the gold star solution uh, is there's this cool library called White Noise, which works with any Whiskey app. Um, and that will basically serve optimized static files directly from your Python application. Um, and it also compresses files, sets the correct headers, stuff like that. Um, but this does mean that you build uh, 
m potentially multiple copies of your static files into your container images, which can result in a larger container image. Um, and I'm actually going to recommend the gold star <laughs> option in this case, because um, it is very easy, actually. Uh, you install white noise. Uh, it has specific Django integration, has general kind of whiskey middleware you can use. Um, and the question is, isn't this like very slow? Um, and the answer is no. If, first of all, you should use a CDN, so most of the requests for your static files don't ever reach your Python application. Um, it also will pre-generate all the compressed files and hashes and things like that ahead of time. Um, also, modern WSGI servers will just use the send file syscall to actually send these static files, so it's pretty efficient. Um, right, and deployments. Um, so, previously, before you were on Kubernetes, so you were running uh, this Python application just on a EC2 host or VM or something. Um, what a lot of people would do is update the code on that machine, so they might do something as simple as like a git pull or install a new package or have their config management tool update the code and then they uh, reload it basically. And whiskey servers, you can send them a signal and they'll do like a graceful reload. Um, you can also just restart the thing. Um, but when we work with containers, we actually never, um, we never change the running code in a container. You never want to do that. We want containers to be immutable. So what we rather do is when we have some new code, build a new image, start some new containers, and then once that container is running, we switch the traffic over from the old container to the new container. And then we shut down the old one. And this is sort of commonly referred to as like a blue-green deployment. There are lots of variations on this. Um, you can read more at that link. Uh, yeah, so deployments, uh, solution. Kubernetes has this thing called a deployment, which is great, and will do most of the basics for you. Um, so it can do sort of blue-green. Uh, it may not have the history of all your deployments, depending on the like options you set it with. They also like quite, you know, there's only certain kind of strategies it has for switching between uh, two sets of containers. Um, so kind of the next things, if you're getting more advanced, is uh, what a lot of continuous deployment tools that integrate with Kubernetes will do is they'll actually run multiple deployments and have a single deployment for each version of your application and then kind of switch between the different deployments through some other process. Um, and this potentially you have like fast rollbacks if you keep your old deployment running for a little while but while you have the new one. So you can just switch the traffic immediately back and you can do lots of kind of advanced things. Um, but you may have more resource usage if you're running more things and you'll need more tooling. And then Gold Star is like moving on to all these like kind of test and production techniques where you doing canarying, like maybe sending 1% of traffic to the new version, um, doing like A-B testing, all kinds of things. That's like a huge talk all on its own. Um, yeah, and you'll need a lot of tooling to do that. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to recommend a deployment to start out. Um, and this is what a deployment looks like. Uh, so basically a bunch of YAML. We've seen kind of the containers I had written out before. Um, and so in this case, few things worth noting. We have three replicas, uh, so we're running three pods, three copies of the same pod, and that's a replica set. Um, obviously, you can change that to like five, and then Kubernetes will just do that for you. Um, and these are the different containers. Cool. Uh, another thing just to note when you're doing deployments and moving to Kubernetes is, whereas before you might have like quite a large virtual machine running you know, like lots of Nginx or and G-Unicorn worker processes. Uh, generally, we want to aim for like pods that are a bit smaller. We don't want huge pods, and there are a few reasons for this. Um, we can do like finer grain scaling. We're not like doubling our capacity every time we add another pod. Um, there's more redundancy. So if your pods are running on like multiple different hosts, and one of those hosts goes out, it's better than all your traffic going, um, and it's better for things like canarying. Um, when you're sending a small amount of traffic to a smaller pod, um, it's not terribly useful to send a small amount of traffic to a huge pod because you have no um, real measure of the performance that it has. Um, yeah, but there are some cons. You have kind of this increased overhead, uh, especially in terms of RAM, because you're just running all these containers, and you have a greater need for automation. You can't really like inspect just a single instance of a thing. You're going to need some kind of tool to like collect the logs from all these various things you have running. Um, right, configuration. 
Um, so previously, this you probably did this in some way similar to uh, code deploy. Uh, so you might update the config, probably using some kind of config management tool, um, and then you would reload or restart. Um, but when we come to Kubernetes, again, we don't want to be like changing things inside a container. Uh, so we actually want to run a new container with a new config and then switch over to that container um, and eventually shut down the old one, do a green deploy again. Um, all right, so there are a few different ways to do this with Kubernetes. When you're just starting out, you can just define environment variables in your deployment for each container. So you can just set the values of things. And that's nice and simple. It works. Um, but you might end up with this huge deployment YAML full of all kinds of things. Um, and you have to pack all your config kind of into strings because you're just working as environment variable string key values. Um, better is Kubernetes has a contract called a config map. So you store config in this thing called config map that we spoke about earlier with the Nginx stuff. Um, and then you can import the config in a config map using either environment variables, or you can mount it as files in a volume in that container. Um, and it's kind of cool. You can separate your app and config. The big kind of gotcha with config maps is that they are mutable. So you can change them, and then the config in your running container will change. And whether your app picks it up or not, who knows? Um, yeah, so kind of the best practice is really to create a new config map each time you change your config and have immutable config maps. Um, you will probably need some extra tooling for this, unfortunately, but it is fairly easy to do with some very common tools in the Kubernetes space. Um, so I'm going to recommend you go for the immutable config maps. Um, but here's just an example of a config map. We already did one with the Nginx container, like I said. In that case, we were mounting a config file into a volume for the container. In this case, we are using a config map to set environment variables for this container. So you can either set specific environment keys from, from specific keys in the config map, or you can set all the keys in the config map into the environment variables using this end from um, uh, declaration. So then we just reference the config map, all those database host, database name, etc., are going to be in the environment. Um, then credentials. Uh, this, by this, I mean like, uh, say, like database username, password, uh, API keys, that kind of thing. Uh, things that you wouldn't want other people to get a hold of. Um, so starting out, you probably could just put this in your config with the rest of your config. Um, and maybe if you had like good access controls on the config, that's not the end of the world. Um, and it might not be any worse than what you're <laughs> already doing. Um, but this does mean that your credentials are stored in plain text in etc. D, which is kind of the backing data store for Kubernetes. So if anybody has any access to that, they can just read everything. Then Kubernetes does have this resource called a secret. This is very, very similar to a config map, but the values are encrypted. Um, so in this case, cool, we can use it just like a config map. We separate the sensitive uh, config from normal config. Um, you may have to figure out some tooling around this so you don't just end up with a bunch of YAML files with your secrets in them. And then you have to protect those as well, and it gets complicated. Um, also, Kubernetes, if you just run it like yourself, by default, Kubernetes doesn't encrypt secrets, actually. It just base64 encodes them, which is not great. Um, but it does have uh, the system called envelope encryption. And if you use Kubernetes through a cloud provider, they will have set this up, and your secrets will actually be encrypted. Um, uh, then if you want to go like the extra mile and be super cool, you can use HashiCorp Vault or something similar. Um, and it's a completely separate service where you store your secrets. Um, this is like about as secure as it gets. I think if you're a bank, you're probably doing this already. Um, and there are other advantages to using services like this. Like you can audit the access to the secrets, create secrets dynamically. Um, but this is additional infrastructure, and it likely requires some kind of changes to your app to actually fetch those secrets. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about secrets for today. Um, and yeah, so in this case, I am. Um, not defining a secret using YAML and just using the command line. So 
you will just kind of run this as a once-off thing, um, and you will set create the secret called Django credentials, and we'll put the database user and password in there. Um, so, yeah. And we can use that, again, exactly like a config map. So we can add it to this end from thing, and then it will become environment variable. We can also mount uh, secrets as files in a volume. In some cases, it might be better to mount them as files in a volume. Uh, sometimes environment variables will be shown if you like have a debug page on your web app. Um, and then database migrations. Um, right, so when you're starting out, uh, you might use this thing called an init container, which is basically a container that will run uh, before the normal containers in your deployment do and just does like a once-off operation. Uh, this is kind of cool because you have like some basic automation, you run your migrations, very simple, but it runs on every pod start. And in some cases, you also might want to run your migrations actually after deploying your new code rather than before. Um, so what we generally recommend is you use this construct called a job in Kubernetes, which is like part of Kubernetes kind of batch work framework. Uh, so it's just like a one-off container that gets run. So you will run this job and it runs your migrations. Um, and this is important because you get to separate the deployment of your schema changes from the deployment of your app because they are different things. Um, but you will probably need some kind of automation for this. So gold star is like you get your job triggered by some kind of continuous deployment that probably does like a migration either before your deployment or afterwards. Um, but you need the CD system to do that. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about the job for now. <coughs> um, yeah, so this is what a job looks like. Uh, we're running our container using the same image I was using before. Um, and you can see the command if anybody... If you use Django, you're quite familiar with these kind of migrate commands. Uh, we set the username and password. Pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, but like I said, you need to run this kind of manually. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a wrap up of all the different things. I'm not going to go through them again. Uh, you can take a picture if you want a reference. Uh, yeah. And then uh, finally, I just want to. <laughs> back one, sorry. <laughs> I still see some cameras. I am going ahead. Uh, okay, and then, like I said, I just wanted to talk a little bit about like the future of this. Um, so I think a lot of the complication with deploying these whiskey apps on Kubernetes is that these whiskey servers were just kind of designed for a different time, um, and they they work well. Uh, but there is kind of a lot to kind of get right or maybe get wrong, and it's quite complicated. And this code snippet is from the Django documentation on how to deploy your Django web app using uWhiskey. And those are a lot of options. Um, and a lot of them just don't really make sense if you're running in a container. Like, you will set the user in a container. You won't use uWhiskey to do this. You will set which directory you're in. Um, yeah, so um, I think these haven't really been designed for a Kubernetes space. Um, and <coughs> like I said, a lot of the stuff just not necessary. There's so many things you can tweak and adjustable settings, and for beginners, this can be quite overwhelming. Process management, I think, can be managed mostly by Docker and Kubernetes. And just expecting there to be this Nginx present on the host is not such a fair assumption anymore. And I think the learning curve from going from, you know, like Python managed.py run server you know, running a dev server to actually getting something production ready is quite steep, whether you're running on Kubernetes or not. Um, so there's nothing really about Whiskey that m means that it has to be this complicated, but um, there is this ASCII, or Asynchronous Server Gateway Interface, which is kind of our second shot at this kind of thing. Um, so ASCII is more uh, built around this async await stuff in Python 3.5. Um, and so it's quite similar conceptually to Whiskey, uh, but a lot of the stuff we're doing from scratch. So we don't have to design it anymore to be on like a LAMP host. Um, so there are some early ASGA server implementations. Daphne is kind of what came with Django Channels, which started this whole ASGI thing. But since then, the ecosystem has kind of evolved. 
uh, UVCorn has a nice logo, uh, Hypercorn, lots of references to unicorns, although they don't share this design anymore with the Ruby unicorn server I spoke about. Um, yeah, and Django 3 will have ASGI support. Um, there are various other things you can use, like Court is like as close to a Flask async port as it gets, and there are various other, there's just like lots of them, but it's still quite early days for a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, and that's it. Um, so, uh, like I said, first link is my talk from 2017. Second one, there's a good blog by uh, Mark Gatuma, who I met at, Coop at KubeCon last year, um, but that's got like <coughs> lots of YAML samples and stuff in it, which is pretty good. And yeah, thanks. Yeah, good talks. So. <laughs> Sorry. Um, quick question. Uh, I run a dev house and a lot of the stuff looks really intricate and complicated. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we're already playing with Django. We want to get into this. Um, as, as, the, as my dev's boss, <laughs> is it fair for me to expect them to delve into this at, and if so, at what level? Or should I start looking for a dedicated DevOps guy to put his head in this. Where's the overlap? Wh what should be the expectation, in your opinion, on a developer who's putting stuff on a server versus, um, I guess, someone who is not worried at all about what the code is and, you know, focusing purely on the server and that environment? Yeah, it's um, a tricky question. I guess, uh, I think... I don't think it's you know like critical that you get every single thing that I've said here perfect, especially like if you're not at a very large scale, um, especially if you don't have uh, th things like so many services that you you know you really need to know they're all running reliably. Um, uh, I think like personally, if I were to start a startup, I think it would be great to have somebody with like Kubernetes knowledge. Um, so that you can kind of get right onto that with all the advantages um, and not have not be moving on to that much later and kind of transferring all this old stuff onto the new thing um, but yeah it's it's going to be very specific to a particular organization what kind of skills you have yeah thank you sure. well crystals please Okay, if there are no more questions, please let's give him another round of applause.